able to get us to control those given UN codes. And that's, I think, one of the hardest things to do. It's really, really well done. Um, I'm going to bring up something Carlos said last time about the ones that are pure 4K. Yes. You start out here, and oh, when yeah. you come in, that has like a little bit of collapse. If you start in and expand out, that will give you a better ability to sustain the 4Ks. Okay. Or just like stay there, but when you start out, it doesn't always give you anywhere to go that doesn't look a little bit like a, a collapse. Yeah. So if you just start a little more in the center of your body, I think that that'll take that away. There's so much you want. So what changed between uh, last time and this time? <laughs> Uh, Tuesday was a, a, a Murphy's Law Day, mm -hmm. where I set aside time to look at the tech beforehand, and then yeah. that didn't, didn't get to happen. So I spent a lot of time looking at what the translation is, what I think it was. Yeah, uh, good. And I asked you about it. At least you were honest and said, I don't know. <laughs> and yeah. Now you fixed it, and it changed everything about your Um So that's a worthwhile thing to think about, like where that goes in your process, about like whether it is do we learn like how the notes sound first, or do we actually read the text first? And, you know where that goes. Um, I've taken more and more as my career has gone on. I've gone further and further down the, the Robert Shaw track of marking more and more things into the store for my singers before I hand them out. And I, I didn't do it you know, on purpose because it's connecting class, but I often like to write the translation in right under where they're singing it. Yeah. Not to do what so many other like stores do and put it at the end or at the beginning, but to go line by line through the piece and like just have it under there. And it helps so much, it also helps you refer to it in rehearsal, but that's something you might like start adding as well to like whatever you're gonna do is, is writing it in line by line and sometimes word by word. Um, I have a couple details I'm just gonna call to your attention and then I'll let Carlos say whatever he's gonna say. There were just a couple of places where I, I think you could phrase a little further than you did. Uh, the first one is the one I just brought up with Matt, the You didn't get all the way to where the altos and tenors were going before you left to cue the sopranos and basses. Go ahead, go check out. Um, and then there's a couple of phrases in here where um, Brahms marks in a diminuendo for everybody pretty early, but usually it's the tenors, but somebody else continues to a suspension past where the diminuendo starts. And I think you could stay with that part longer. So one of those would be in measure 22 for the tenors, or the tenors and the altos. Like the diminuendo starts in the middle of 22, but I think really the tenors and altos are carrying what they're doing into 23. Sure. Yeah. And you can like ignore them and move in and like enjoy those moments. Uh, where was the other one? Uh, there's uh, uh, another thing like that in like 40, 48, 49. You, yes, that's the other one. Yeah. Yeah, 48, 49. You can really stay with the tenors like going through that phrase uh, as well. Uh, oh, and yeah, and uh, you did a really nice uh, subtle Chris. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to ask, and I'd be interested to see what Carlos thinks about this. Um, the unte mana. Mm -hmm. It looks to me like Brahms says because there's a super long slur at the beginning, that he then wants it not to be slurred later. Right, the unte mana does her To me, it's what he wrote and instead of unte mana does her and keeping it goofy. Yeah. Disagreement. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's yeah. Agree. No, that's good. So you would just keep it legato all the way yes. through? Yes. Yes. It just it's a linguistical thing. Because it, it, there is no reason. There is no reason to articulate there. At the end of the day, I have to say that when you articulate, which in German is the pain in the neck, uh, the consonants, then you get a little brain. You get that. Yeah. Yeah. Not like the Italians where it's like up and nobody cares. <laughs> but yeah, that was the one place where I couldn't tell, do you want us to carry through or not? And if you aren't insistent, we ain't going to be able to do it. So like this is the moment you've got to insist on. I have three things in uh, uh, tempo, physicality, and dynamics. I liked it a lot. Tempo, uh, because from the uh, from the leaders and I think you do it on purpose, but you 
you start to get slower. I'm not, I, I'm not actually a religious about keep the tempo where it is because I think it has to slightly relax. You just relax a little bit uh, too much. Second, if I can talk in dynamics uh, for the next time you conduct it because you are so expressive and sometimes you do it. And there is one thing I wanted to mention like, bravo, first candidate I see doing that. Uh, can you please next time differentiate between pianissimo and piano? Uh, but one thing where I thought like, yes, finally, it is not varum. And you did very clearly varum, that intensity. And physicality is uh, just for your own kind of comfort. Try just as an exercise to force the intensity because you have a lot of and not get tense. You get a lot of this, and I'm thinking, like, yeah, no, you want to have a 45 year career, and you're a young man, don't go there. Try to, how does it work when I'm actually incredibly intense, but very relaxed? Yeah. But aside from that, the interpretation, and if, I, you, if I, nobody minds the missing one word, because we're talking about the meaning of the text in the, under Brahms's eyes, and it's the book of Hiob, okay, in German, Hiob. <laughs> I think that uh, the first sentence, Warum ist das nicht gegeben? It points very much in a direction where Brahms is constantly with so much of his music, which is, first of all, ten, uh, times that are past were way better, number one. And second, uh, if we talk Bible, and I'm so far from being a Bible scholar, it reminds me of. Uh, if there is any Bible scholar, we will tell you where this is from, where is, there is great suffering, there is great wisdom. That is why what I, I don't see anger in this piece. I see, I see suffering. Oh. Very un-American way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be angry. No, to, be, to look at suffering as a way to grow instead of be angry is very un-American. Yes. <laughs> So, aside from that, really, I, I think... But that also might help with your attention to think about suffering instead of anger. Yeah, I, 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 there's one moment where I, I allow anger to come, and it's right kind of at the end. It's like, und Gott, und Gott, und Gott. It's like angry at God for doing all this. Um, but, yeah, the, the rest of it is more searching. Like, why is this happening? I'm, you know, I've lost all this. Why have I lost all this? Where did it go? Kind of stuff. And I mean, it's an important question. If there really is an all-powerful, purely good God, why is there all this terrible stuff in the world? I mean, that's, that's an important question. You want to do the beginning again? Sure. And just think about like how to sustain the forte, and then without. <laughs> 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 <laughs>